All right, Zach, man, we are, uh, man, we've been hanging out for a little bit this morning, but uh, man, now we're going to, man, we're going to jump into our conversation here. So, but uh, man, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure to have a great conversation with you. Well, it's an, it's an honor to be asked back. So, uh, so thank you, Nathan. Yeah, absolutely. We had you on, this is actually your third appearance. So the second one, we kind of had a little bit of a gathering of some people, but, uh, having another one-on-one conversation here, I think is, is great because, um, you know, before obviously everybody knows you are uh, with True Tone, but you have another, uh, uh, side of your life called Ask Zach, and uh, man, yeah. we're going to have that conversation a little bit, but uh, you know, just real fast, how are you doing this year? It's been a weird year, uh, just how you doing? Oh, you know, it's doing doing well, doing better than I deserve. Okay. And uh, yeah, I, th- I think that, yes, this year has been bizarre for everybody, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I've, I've spent a lot more time uh, with my family. I've, uh, you know, had to learn how to be, you know, more productive in a time where, you know, kind of our hands were tied, you know, for a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then all of a sudden a business has been really crazy lately, you know, for, uh, yeah. So it's, it's been, uh, it's been weird, but good. And, uh, it's just, it's such a weird time where it seems like, there's, uh, you know, some people that are really, you know, kind of hurting right now and some people are really doing well. And, uh, and that's a interesting topic in itself and just, you know, yeah. So, but yes, I'm overall doing good. How about yourself, man? Nathan? Yeah, we're doing good too. And obviously I'd like to cover this a little bit more, you know, in, in, into the, into the episode, but man, you know, we've been doing really well, you know, at MIRC, you know, we've, um, we've adapted well and, um, but we've seen from our customers, we've really seen the fact that those who were prepared and were selling online are thriving Mm -hmm. and those who weren't, we saw kind of a little bit of a difference there and we, you know, we'll cover a little bit of that in a little bit, but so, you know, man, we've, every day is a challenge every day. We're trying to figure out what we can do better. Um, every day we're tr- figuring out that we were not doing something as best as we could and we get a chance to change that. But I'm telling you what, um, you're right. For some people it's been really tough for some people it's been thriving and we've had, we've had a great, great year so far. So, and we are, we are thankful for that. Good. Good. So, uh, but Hey, I want to jump into, you know, obviously askzack.com, you know, yes. that's you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, um, I mean, you've got it. You, you've got something really cool going, you know, between, you know, your website, the YouTube shows, um, yep. which obviously everybody can access through the website. Uh, but man, I'd love to just dive in and, and, and find out a little bit more about you. If you want to give us just a little bit of a background of how you got there and what that is to catch everybody up, that would be great. Okay, well, I'll, I'll give you the uh, you know the, the the nickel version of of my my story. You know, yeah. grew up in South Texas. You know, moved to Nashville uh, for college. At college, I met Brad Paisley. I worked out on on the road for a while. You know, playing you know six nights a week, playing bars and such. Uh, ended up after a while, you know, had, ended up reconnecting with Brad Paisley. Went, went to work for him as a guitar tech, did that for a couple of years. And then this is kind of where, uh, you know, things happened as far as Ask Zach. So Vintage Guitar Magazine interviewed Brad and they ended up doing a sidebar on, on me yeah. because the, uh, Brad kept uh, being asked questions about his gear and he said something to the effect of, I, I can't remember or, I, you know, I don't recall, uh, I'll have to ask Zach. And so it kind of went from there. Then the editor of the magazine started asking me questions and seeing if I could get answers for him, like what kind of thumb pick does Brent Mason use or something like yeah. that. And then he uh, he pitched the idea to me of, would you like to do a column for Vintage Guitar Magazine? And that was a really interesting moment because I had no background in journalism and you know, it, it was a moment where I could have either, you know, mentally defeated myself mm-hmm. and and said no, or whether I could take a chance. And I'm really glad that I said yes, because it ended up being an amazing 
Uh, it's been, you know, I'm still writing for the magazine. It's been an amazing experience. That's so, a huge turning point for you. I mean, to be able to take that situation and go, man, I don't know if I can do this and say, okay, yeah, I'll do this. And now see what that's turned into over these years. It's, it's, right. it's great. Yes. So it's been, you know, 15 years and, you know, I, you know, of course I, I continued to, uh, to take chances because that's what it, that's what, what it's about. And yeah. so I, I said, Hey, you know, cause I was, I was only writing in you know, my column. And then I said, Hey, can I write a, uh, a story? You know, can I interview somebody? And I, you know, this, this guy that was unknown, that was not really known outside of Nashville at that point, his name was Tom Bukovac. And yeah. I did the very first interview with Tom. Really? Yes. Okay. So, you know, so I feature, and so it was a huge thing. And Tom even said that it, you know, cause this was back in 2005 that I interviewed Bukovac. And so it helped his career. And he even told me, he said, you know, people saw the interview and he got, you know, and it, it was mentioned a lot by, you know, producers and people that he was working with. And, and then it went on and that was kind of a, a shorter article. And then I started doing some cover stories. I did, uh, interviews with Keith Urban and Brad Paisley and a ton of session guys in Nashville that I did, yeah. you know, for print. Yeah. And, uh, and that, you know, ended up being, uh, you know, a, a lot of fun and a great, uh, you know, springboard. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I know this is kind of a, you know, fun little side of things, but you know, one of these days I'll get it out of you who you think's a better guitar player. Brad Paisley or Keith Urban, but we, we don't have to do that today. <laughs> no, no, we're, we're, yeah. So, you know, so then in, in the process of, of, uh, of writing for Vintage Guitar Magazine, uh, things started to change. Yeah. So, you know, the, the problem is, you know, I think probably most people are aware that uh, print media has changed. Yeah. It's just, it's just a fact of life. Mm -hmm. And so as those changes happened, and as uh, word counts went down, because that's that's one of the if you if you look at any guitar magazine, any print magazine, you will notice that it has probably gotten smaller. Yeah. It's not as thick as, as they used to be. A lot of them don't have the quality paper that they used to use. Yeah. And a lot of articles are shorter. And so when you reduce word count, that's how writers get paid. Yeah. So. I, I ended up in a position to where my income went down mm -hmm. and that was, and, and frankly, I was, I was upset about it, but you know, and I, and I said something to the people at, you know, at the, the editor at vintage guitar, but he's in between a rock and a hard place oh, sure. because yeah. So, so all of us have situations where, you know, where all of a sudden our income or something changes because that's, that's kind of the rule of life is that everything changes. Nothing yeah. stays the same. So for about a year, I continued to just kind of be upset about, you know, what had happened and my, the reduced income from that. And then finally I, uh, I got off my rear end and I decided, well, I'm going to do my own thing. You know, because you can't you can't expect other people to be looking out for you. You have to look out for yourself. Yeah. So, I made the decision to start uh, my own YouTube channel, and uh, and also have a website, and and do all of the the back end things that need to be done. Like, I contacted a trademark lawyer, and I trademarked Ask Zach, yeah. because. I knew that I needed to have some type of protection if I was going to be going forward with this. And this had been my identity for, you know, 15 years anyway. Mm -hmm. And I probably should have, you know, gotten this trademark years ago. But I went ahead and filed for that, which, of course, that takes, you know, six to eight months to do something like that. But it was granted uh, earlier this year. And, you know, I, I, I started getting getting a website going. And also I paid for a designer to, uh, you know, to create a logo for me because I knew I needed to have a real identity and I didn't want to just throw something together. Yeah. You know, because also I was think I was thinking forward in that I might want to start selling merchandise at some point. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to sell merchandise, you need to have a good looking logo. Yeah, absolutely. And okay, I'd, love so I'll, to, I'd love to ask you real fast though. I mean, yeah. You, you're given some great information on some decisions you made, but 
Tell me just a little bit more when you were facing that you were going, okay, change is upon me. I've got to do something. And you wrestled with it. And you said you wrestled for about a year. What were some of the things that were going through your mind? Was it like, I've never even thought about doing a YouTube channel. That sounds, that sounds too tough is, or the process of changing. Talk a little bit about right. that. I'd like to know your thought process. Yeah. Well, I think at, at first it was obviously, um, you know, this isn't fair. Why are they doing this to me? Which is completely unproductive. <laughs> it, that does nothing. Yeah. You know, no, you know, no one's out to get you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and the guys at vintage guitar are great. It was just that the situation had changed. Yeah. So then I finally, you know, started thinking about, okay, I had actually had pressure from friends of mine for years to do a YouTube channel. Yeah. It and seems so, like the thing to do. Yeah. Well, and, and they, I even had one friend who would come to the true tone offices and he would sit down with me and just have me talk about stuff and he would tape it and put it up on YouTube because he was, and I think he's removed them, but his, his name is Austin Skinner and he's a longtime friend of mine. And he was, you know, kind of prodding me that you need to do this. This is something you can do and that you would be good at. Yeah. And, and it was finally, you know, of course I'd also d been doing interviews for the true tone lounge yeah. and had done that, you know, for a number of years. And finally it was to the point of, okay, I'm going to do this. And that, that was kind of the process. It was, you know, the prodding and finally saying, okay, you know, if I'm going to have to make this happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also, uh, I need to say that mentors are very important. Absolutely. And so I'm glad you, you brought know, that up. Yeah, mint and and I think sometimes you know I'm 47 years old, and sometimes you know the the older you get, sometimes it can be harder to look to others for wisdom, mm -hmm. and sometimes it can be even harder if someone's you know younger than you. But yes, you need to look to anyone for you know for wisdom, and you need help when you you know when you jump into something. So I was very fortunate in that while doing the True Tone Lounge, which of course I still do, I was contacted by a guy named Keith Williams. And Keith Williams has a YouTube channel called Five Watt World. Mm -hmm. And he has a, it's a huge channel. Mm -hmm. And he's also friends with Rick Beato. I don't know if you know yep. who Rick Beato is. Oh Be yeah. I Rick mean, who Beato doesn't? Has, yeah. <laughs> has, it was like a million and a half subscribers. And, yeah. and, uh, you and know, that's, yeah. they're all part of the world of the, that flat5.com, right? Uh, yes, which yes. is uh, instructional, or you can uh, also, geared towards, and also merchandise. Merchandise, and, yeah, uh -huh, yeah. yes. So I uh, I started talking with Keith Williams about doing a show because, again, it's not like you just you know you can just jump in, but you know I wanted to get as much insight as I could. So I contacted Keith Williams, and he was very kind enough to, you know, kind of clue me in on a number of things that were really important. And one of the things that, uh, can be a, a huge roadblock is that if you're going to start a huge YouTube channel, you think, Oh, I need to spend a ton of money on gear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yes. And, and Keith Williams told me, he said, look, You've got to just start. You've got to start doing it and don't invest a bunch of money. Just use your phone, you know, and, and, and go forward. And so, and he said, no matter what, you're going to hate those first episodes that you do yeah. because you're going to learn from them and you're going to get better. Yeah. So you have to start somewhere. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, we felt that way too. Even starting this show, you know, you go back and watch his first few episodes and you're like, man, what were we doing? You know, but it's a process. You don't, you don't know what to do until you, sometimes you're in the middle of it and you just got to do it. Right. And those you know, really, uh, you know, it, it teaches you a lot because that's an, that's another major roadblock because a lot of people can get stymied in the planning, you know, and the, and the, you know, and instead of doing it, they keep talking about, Oh, well, I need to be looking at all these cameras and lights and all this other stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you let that stop you from getting started, yeah. you just need to get started. Yeah. So you, you jump in and then 
I continued to talk to uh, to Keith Williams, who's up in the Northeast, and uh, you know, talk to him on the phone every week. And he would tell me things like, "You need to work on your thumbnails." You know, so seriously, okay. Yes, you need to work oh, on your titles. And so, you know, that's not the kind of feedback you want. But you have to have the humility to take that feedback from someone because he was a hundred percent on the money. Because many of us don't realize that people are taking in most information on their phone. Yeah. So if you don't have a good thumbnail and a good title that will look good small, you're you're lost. Yeah, and you look at a lot of those, you know, some of the really even like even Rick Beatos, you know, you, you look at that and the pictures, like if they're sharing anything on you know, social media, Instagram, Facebook. You know, those pictures are always captivating, you know, yes. you know, they're always, they're always well lit. They're, they're, they, they almost describe what the, the show is going to be about by literally looking at a picture. So yes. you're right. He, he's right. There, yeah. there's, there needs to be thought into that. Right. So, so that was an, another, uh, you know, kind of, th- you know, really important thing that I learned and, uh, and I'm, again, I'm gr- very grateful to, uh, to Keith for, uh, you know, allowing, uh, you know, well, for just his input and him taking the time because there, there was no advantage to him. And then he ended up also, uh, you know, plugging my show on his show. Yeah. And so, you know, he gave me like a, a thousand subscribers. So anyway, just to in January of this year is when I launched Ask Zach as far as a channel on YouTube. And, you know, I, I had goals right away of, Okay, I want to monetize my channel, so I need a thousand subscribers, and I need, you know, so many hours of views. And so I went about, you know, making that, you know, my my goal, and even asking people on social media, even on like Facebook or Instagram, saying, "Hey, you know, would you please go here and subscribe to me?" Hey, I did. You know, I, I didn't. I didn't do it multiple <laughs> times, but it's like, yeah, yeah and, and thank you, uh-huh. and. Uh, you know, so you you have to do those kinds of things, and you you have to be willing to kind of you know uh, to put it out there, to be willing to uh, you know to ask those things, and not be so you know proud that you, uh, you know, that you won't ask for those kind of things. But also, you don't want to you don't want to go too far with yeah. that, where you're asking people for things all the time. Now, you know? also too, at this point in time, I mean, as you're you're changing and you're adapting, you know, for those who who for those of, uh, who are listening to this can be having an encouragement. I mean, were you still thinking, man, I don't know if I can do this or were you far enough down the road that you were building confidence or uh, just kind of talk through your, what you were thinking at this point in time? Cause I know there's a lot of, uh, businesses out there, music stores that go, man, I know what I need to do, but they might still be at that point where they're like, Oh man, that just seems like too much work. That seems like too much, too many decisions to make. I don't know if I have the time. Uh, but changing and adapting to adversity is a big deal that everybody needs to deal with. So what were you thinking right. at this point in time in the process? Well, I was, you know, I was dealing with the fact that uh, I was worried that it was going to take me a year before I could get a thousand subscribers and, <laughs> and get the, how long did it take number. you? It <laughs> took me about two months. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. But in, in January, and what I found was that I had to, one is that consistency was so important. Yeah. And then I found out that if I, if, you know, again, because I had the time, I did two episodes a week for a while. And when you're doing that much content and it's regular, if you set, okay, I'm going to release an episode every Tuesday. And so I actually, for a while there, I did Tuesdays and Fridays okay. and you start building up a relationship and it's important to be yourself and be natural because you just can't sustain putting on some type of phony and I, I hate this because my, my dad was a car dealer, but you know, this kind of car salesman, you know, kind of, Hey, you know, thanks so much. We're going to, yeah, you know, <laughs> that's, you know, people want, uh, you know, genuineness Yeah. and, uh, you know, you, you need to, to be yourself and, uh, yeah. And people love stories. People, you know, people want to hear stories and they want to hear stories that they can learn from and, uh, and, and grow from. So yes, there was a, there was a lot of, uh, you know, pressure to, to make the show better. There was a lot of pressure that I was putting on myself 
to uh, you know to to get more subscribers and and more views and and those things and and I just kind of kept you know kept pushing because there were moments where I said oh you know this is not really working this is I'm putting so much effort into this and I'm not getting paid anything yeah you know, see because, that's yeah this is an important moment in the process because I think. 98% of the people who are out there who are trying to do something different and something new, that's what they're thinking. That's what they're, right. they're going, I just don't know about this. I just don't know if this is going to work out. Right. So then, you know, of course, a very interesting thing happened and that was, uh, you know, COVID. So all of a sudden there was, here comes another you know, curveball. Yeah. A, a huge curveball. And it created an atmosphere where more people were taking in, uh, you know, content from YouTube, but also you had so many, much more competition. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden there were more people watching, but there were so many more, you know, content providers. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so then it, it, it makes you have to, you know, continue to hone in and continue to think about, you know, topics that are interesting, good storytelling, good thumbnails, good titles, all, all those things. And, and you throw things out there and sometimes something is a hit and sometimes it's not, mm -hmm. but you know, you keep building a relationship. You keep, um, you keep responding to comments and you keep, you know, trying to create a community instead of just, you know, here I am, you know, watch me. Yeah. You know, it, you, you need to interact with people and create a community so that they feel part of something and so that they feel some kind of, you know, sense of ownership. Yeah. Now, you at know. this point in time, I mean, you still are with Vintage Guitar Magazine. Has that helped that uh, that aspect, the, the periodical side of things or or were you starting to go, oh, I'm going to go my own way? I mean, how's that relationship and, and how are you building on that? Well, I'm, I'm continuing to write for Vintage Guitar Magazine, and uh, I think th the fact that I had 15 years of you know of writing for a periodical uh, that certainly did not hurt. Yeah, I you know because it made it to where I wasn't just reaching you know out of, I wasn't coming from nowhere. So you know when when you have a, a column in a magazine called Ask Zach. And, you know, that's kind of been an identity that you've had in the guitar community for 15 years. Mm -hmm. Then when you do come out with a, a YouTube channel, uh, you know, it, it, it does help. That doesn't mean that, you know, overnight you're going to, you know, have a huge following. But it, the other thing is, is, you know, getting getting the word out and, you know, and, and build building a following. You know, it, it takes time. So. But as, as I went on, uh, I continued to talk to my mentor, Keith Williams, and uh, he, you know, he said, you know, uh, because I finally, you know, I got to the point of monetization and then I started thinking about merch, you know, selling merchandise. And that ended up being a really important step because, you know, that was, you know, people, if, if you don't know this, you know, the you usually get paid from YouTube for putting ads in your video where you've monetized your channel. You get about $3 and 50 cents per thousand views. Okay. All right. I didn't think about know that the number. Yeah. So you, okay. you need a lot of views to, for it to add up to anything. Right. And so, you know, you can, you can have, you know, 5,000 views, you know, or you could sell a, a t-shirt or two. Yeah. And so, you know, those, those kinds of things really, so it, it helps you understand the fact that, okay, I need to have good content and, and I need to create these relationships where people feel invested enough, not just to watch, but also to, you know, to purchase, you know, from, uh, you know, yeah. purchase something from you to support the channel. So, you know, so you were, so I'd much rather have, uh, lower views of people that really care about the show, mm -hmm. you know, who want to support the show than have quote a hit where, you know, you've, you know, like I have videos that have had 80,000 views, but, you know, but from that, you know, I, you know, I, I might not have sold very much, you know, from it. And yeah, also, sure. you know, even, you know, so no, anyway. that, that does bring up a good point that obviously, you know, you're gearing your show and what you're doing towards a specific audience. I mean, you yeah. know, and, and you know, when you look at your website, you know, and you look at the shows that you're doing, 
Um, you know, you do have a wide variety of topics. Um, you have some things that are yeah. dear to your heart. Um, you know, I, I was sitting there going, I was just like, oh man, he did a, uh, you know, you did an episode on the Klon pedal, which, yeah. you know, it might, that might not be, you know, what guitar player, you know, vintage guitar players like, but man, you've got pedal guys that would love that. So, you know, you're kind right. of branching out and, and touching lots of subjects, but also, you know, kind of telling the story, uh, of, in each specific episode as well, you know, it's kind of drawing people in. But my point is, is, you know, you, you know, you can't go, man, what am I going to do to get a million views? Well, you don't necessarily want a million views. You may want 50,000 views of people who care about who you are and what you're doing. Right. Because you, you want to, yeah, you, you want to have a, a, a real, you know, following and yeah. And, and through all this, you know, it's, it's, it's been interesting, you know, because one of the big lessons that I've learned is that I grow and do more when I'm uncomfortable than when I'm comfortable. So adversity brings on growth mm -hmm. if you have the right attitude, because you can have the attitude of, Oh, woe is me. You know, the world hates me. Or you, or you can say, I'm unhappy with this situation what can I do to change things? Yeah. You know, I'm, un I'm unhappy with what's going on. I'm going to start my own YouTube channel or let's, let's bring it closer to home. You know, I'm selling stuff on amazon.com and all of a sudden, you know, the, uh, the fees that they're charging have gotten higher. Yeah. You know, I'll put on my true tone hat for a second and say, you know, I've gotten calls from, from dealers that would sell true tone products, you know, on Amazon. And I've gotten calls from them saying, Hey, your pricing is not fair. There's not enough margin. <laughs> and it's like, what? Yeah. You know, that we've, you know, we haven't changed our pricing or anything. And then finally he, you know, you know, he fessed up that, you know, he's he's not a brick and mortar. He doesn't have a website and he's only been selling on Amazon. Yeah. And and the fact that Amazon's, you know, uh, you know, fees have kept, you know, going up and he's making less and less margin. Yeah. Well, that's not, that's not our fault. Yeah. You know, that's Amazon is looking out for Amazon. Amazon does not look out for dealers. They don't look out for dealers or manufacturers. The only person that, you know, Amazon looks out for Amazon and for the customers that are buying things. Yeah. Those are the only people that Amazon is concerned about. You know, you could say the same thing about reverb reverb, just, you know, raised their, you know, raised their, uh, their percentage. Well, it's like, what are you going to do there? You know, you can decide, okay, I'm just going to eat it. Or are you going to take this as an opportunity to, to do something different? Are you going to finally create your own website or find other ways? Because there's all these ways in which yeah. you can, uh, you know, on, on social media, which of course, you know, social media is out to make money too. So it's like, how can you create your own, you know, your own community and your own, you know, repeat business, repeat buyers where, you know, you create your own niche and, and that's when you've really done something because otherwise you're just creating, you're just working for reverb and you're just working for Amazon because, because you're, you're driving people to their website. Yeah. And, and it's very true. And I understand too, that it could feel, it could seem exhausting trying to figure out what path that people take, you know, as change is happening, you know, right. they feel that they feel the adversity, you know, coming on them. Um, yeah. um, you know, I, and I get that, you know, you do have to, you have to make decisions about what am I going to do to take care of what I have to be able to grow now? Hey, I get it. You know, that might involve to some degree, Amazon's reverb, eBay sales channels, Etsy, Pinterest, you know, and that right. might be part of your strategy. You know, but at the end of the day, um, you know, for the example of the guy who was only selling on Amazon, it's just kind of like, you know, we're kind of living in a world now as things are changing that that approach to things is just not, it, it's, it's, well, it's not the only way, but it's also not going to cut it. We have to, you know, you have to be able to make change. You have to be yes. able to stretch yourself, do things that you've never done before so that you can build on what you have. Right. Another thing that happened because of COVID, because for a while there, uh, you know, everything, you know, like in, in mid to late March and early April, things were really shut down. Um, 
in, in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. And, uh, during that time, you know, that's, that's when I created my website. Yeah. You know, it, it was kind of like, well, you know, at, you know, <laughs> cause you can't go to the movies and you can't go out to eat, you know, there was all this time and it was like, well, I can just mope around and play video games or I can do something productive. And so that's when I, that's when I created my website. And so, you know, if, if you go to askzack.com, there is a lot of content there. There is. And so, you know, I've spent a, a, a long time doing that. And, uh, you know, and it was kind of a blessing, uh, <laughs> I, you know, because I, I try to look on the bright side of, of, of COVID. And it was like, it was kind of a bright side in that, you know, I wasn't able to distract myself with other things. And so I, I created a, you know, a website yeah. and had plenty of time it, to do it. it. Yeah. Had plenty of time to do it. Yeah. So, and now, you know, and something that you hit on earlier was that, uh, again, I'm, I'm kind of wearing my true tone hat here and, fine. uh, it's that we love uh, true tone here. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's the fact that, you know, watching what happened with dealers, you know, d during, during COVID. And it's like the guys that were, were willing, you know, that had good online presence mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and were willing to, you know, to ship and do things like that. They've done really well. And I think, you know, you would, you would echo that, yeah. you know, I think you were saying that earlier. Yeah. We've actually seen a, uh, you know, we've seen a demand for guitars just skyrocket through the roof yeah. now, uh, you know, and it's just because, you know, and part of the deal was, is we saw the world change literally overnight as music stores, um, you know, across the United States were so used to guitars walking into their stores, being traded, being sold. Um, now all of a sudden when, when a lot of the mandates happened with COVID-19, um, that supply of guitars, that supply chain literally just shut down. Now, People were still online and they were still buying. And um, I think that a lot of um, people have become savvy enough to where maybe they can go ahead and list their own guitar on a sales channel opposed to walking into a music store. So the online sales just shot up. And, and so, you know, people were not getting guitars in like they were used to. And so they were coming to us going, we need more. We need more. And we've been adapting to that and doing the best that we can. But the problem, but the issue is, it's those who were online with a strong presence realizing that that's the way things were going anyways. They right. just, they're killing it. They're just, they're yeah. doing extremely well. Um, and I've yeah. had some dealers that I've talked to, they don't sell a whole lot online. And I ask how are things going? And they're like, man, it's dead. Nobody's walking in the store. Hey, are you selling online? Yeah, I sell online to, to move some older product. Well, is that, is that, are you going to incorporate that in your strategy now? You know, and they're, right. and they're just now thinking about the idea of that being a main strategy and a source of income and they, they have struggled. And so no doubt about yeah. it, uh, no doubt about it. So we're encouraging them as best as we possibly can to use sales channels, to build their own website, to incorporate social media as, as a strategy, um, because, um, obviously you have to. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think. Change is just the constant, <laughs> which, you know, yeah. which is funny to say, but it's true. I mean, the, it, things are constantly changing. It's that, are you willing to adapt? You know, are you willing to adapt when print media, you know, you know, stops being as lucrative as it used to be? Are you just going to say, oh, damn, you know, the world hates me. Or are you going to create another opportunity for yourself? Yeah. If when COVID happens, you know, which we're still in it, it's like, are you, you know, are you going to find other sales channels? Are you going to find, you know, other ways to, to move product or are, are you going to shut your doors? Yeah. And, and I even think about, you know, years ago talking to an, uh, another, you know, another manufacturer that I won't mention their name, but they had, uh, you know, when, when guitar center just started all this, you know, gobbledygook where they've kind of been in and out of, of, you know, trouble and, uh, and they, you know, they were admitting to the fact that Guitar Center represented 40% of their sales. Mm. And, you know, that's, you know, when you have too much of your sales, you know, that are going through, you know, one customer or all of your sales are going through Amazon, it's, or Reverb or any of those things, it's like things change. Yeah. And so, you know, and things happen out of your control. So are you going to shift 
you know, are you going to, you know, take the time to shift? Are you going to create your own website? Cause it's like, it's not that hard. I'm not a computer programmer. You know, it's, you know, it's like, I found, mm -hmm. you know, an, an interface that was easy for me to populate things. And I, and I, and I paid for some help, but you know, it was, it was very worthwhile. And now it's like, and I'm able to, you know, continue to, you know, upload information and I don't, I'm not having to send it to someone else. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm doing it myself. Oh yeah, absolutely. Square yeah. pay, Squarespace, Wix, Shopify. Yeah. They've, they've, they've sunk million, hundreds of millions of dollars into making their, uh, making people who don't know what they're doing to be able to know what they're doing. And exactly. you can absolutely do it. If I can do it, uh, then it, then yeah. anybody can do it. So, yeah. you know, it's kind of like on, on my website, it's like, I'm able to have, uh, you know, Spotify links where it has, yeah. you know, playlists. Cause, cause I'll let's, you know, let's talk about an episode I did, you know, recently on, on John Jorgensen and JV Telecasters. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like I did, you know, I did a YouTube, you know, video on it. And then I also did a companion, uh, you know, post on my website that had, uh, of course, a link to the original YouTube video. Plus, I had a a Spotify playlist, you know, that was talking about tunes where John Jorgensen played this specific guitar. Yeah. And then I put pictures that John Jorgensen provided to me of his guitar and, you know, pictures of my guitar that I had taken apart. And part of that was for educational purposes because I had such a hard time finding out information on this guitar that I had to gather it all myself. And yeah. then I thought, you know, I'm going to help other people identify these guitars. That's a great these idea. These, yeah, these were these Japanese-made Fender guitars that were made from 1982 to 84. And they're very collectible, but they're hard to identify because there's not a whole lot of information. And so uh, I took mine apart and, you know, and took pictures and, yeah, you know, I just see to, that. you know, just to educate others because I had to, you know, I had to work so hard to find and there, there's so much available on online if you just will search and, and vet, you know, information on things. Yeah. So, man, I'll tell you what, uh, you know, John Jorgensen, speaking of that, uh, um, that episode on, on your, uh, on your website, man, you know, I did, I knew who he was. We've actually got some of his guitars in here. I mean, he's got some signature models through Takamini and stuff like that. But, right. you know, speaking of that specific telly and then you gave I went through and listened to like Hello Trouble going. Yeah. I actually don't know that song. So I went and I was like, I'm going to listen to that. And holy cow, man, I just, you know, he just wasn't on my radar. You know, when I was younger growing yeah. up and, you know, I was sitting there listening to, you know, shit rock music and, you know, ACDC and Guns N' Roses and trying to learn that stuff. And then here's this guy over here. You know, now I'm listening to that and I'm like, oh my, it's, holy cow, man. It just, it blew me away. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the mastery of what he's doing in that song on that solo, just start from that, you know, right into that solo. And then he doesn't, <laughs> yeah. it's like, he's playing, he's playing, he's playing all the notes, but it's all the right notes. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, that's, that's one of the things I, I, I just try to, you know, politely, you know, kind of clue people into things that maybe they haven't been exposed to. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I do, I do episodes like done episodes like on, uh, some of my favorite R and B players like, uh, Cornell Dupree and Bobby Womack, who are guys that are, you know, maybe, you know, some guys haven't heard of, you know, they haven't heard the name, but they've heard the playing before. Like, yeah. you know, uh, like, you know, if you've heard the song rainy night in Georgia, you know, by Brooke Benton, you know, which was written by Tony Joe white. It's like, you know, that's, you know, it's a master class in, you know, R and B, you know, kind of guitar fills and stuff like that. So I did an episode on that and, you know, and, and people, you know, I'm, you know, it just, it makes me happy when I see comments on the video saying I wasn't aware of Cornell yeah. Dupree and, and I, I really have this, you know, great appreci appreciation for this great player or what you're saying about John Jorgensen. Yeah. So yeah. he was a big influence on your life, correct? Jorgensen? Yeah. Oh yes. I, I, you know, Brad Paisley and I went and saw him uh, when we were both in college. I was 20 and Brad was 21. And there was a, a place here in Nashville called the Asa Clubs. Okay. It's no longer around. But the Helicasters, which was John Jorgensen and Will Ray and Jerry Donahue, and they, they had signature model guitars with G&L and Fender and, and such. And they uh, they were playing at this club and it was 21 and up. And so I had to borrow 
a fake ID, I mean, or a real ID from a friend of mine that was about, that weighed 300 pounds and, and he was a couple inches taller than I was. Yeah. Well, I don't, well, he wasn't 300 pounds, but it, I mean, he yeah. outweighed me by at least 30 pounds. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so, and Brad Paisley told me, he said, as we were walking to the, to the entrance of the club, he said, uh, he said, now, if they don't let you in, I'm going in without you. <laughs> That's right. Screw you, pal. So, <laughs> yeah, so we were huge. We were both huge fans of Jorgensen, and then yeah. I've, yeah, I've, I've interviewed him for the True Tone Lounge, yeah. and uh, you know, and he's he's one of the nicest guys on the planet, uh, you know, and that's and that's why he continues to work. Like last year, he ended up going back out on the road with Elton John. He worked with Elton John, okay. you know, part of Elton's fa uh, farewell tour because he's an amazing musician and he's somebody that you want to be around. Yeah. He's and that, and that's that's kind of the key. I mean, he works really hard at it. It's like John Jorgensen's a guy that he continues to get better. He's in his 60s and he continues to be a better guitar player. Yeah. And he was already amazing. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, absolutely. And even on uh, man, um, uh, you know, Highlander Boogie, and uh, that was the yeah. Helicasters, though, right? Yeah, that was the Helicasters. Uh, you know, but, just and it's an instrumental, instrumental, yeah. just you know, letting it fly. And that was both guitar players, not just him. Correct. Yeah, that was all three of them. All, yeah. All three but, of them. I'm sorry. Yeah. But the, so, but the main, but the main, but the song was written by John and he's playing that main part. And then there's a harmony part with it. Mm -hmm. So, but he's playing the main, you know, guitar part. Yeah. 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 So man, yeah. very cool. I, you know, I look at your website and I look at your YouTube channel and, and what you've got going on. And I think you're just, you're a great example of adapting to change. I mean, you know, you've been in this industry for a long time from, you know, Vintage Guitar Magazine and writing the Ask That column. Yeah. And, and, you know, now you're branching out. And, you know, I just, you know, I think it's a great opportunity for people to hear from you just on, hey, think about some of these things. You need to, you realize yeah. adversity is coming, change is coming. So, I mean, if you yeah. had any one last piece of advice that you would love people to know, what would it yeah, be? I, I would say, you know, I kind of said this earlier, but don't be too proud to uh, to ask for advice from other people that you respect. Mm -hmm. So you know, as a as a dealer or a, you know, as a as a music store owner, you know, look at what other people are doing, or maybe have someone that you don't feel is a direct competitor, because that's that's also part of the thing is when you help out other people. Yeah. Uh, you know, you are basically helping out a competitor. You know, when you're in the in the same field. So you know, there you know. But everyone is there's a lot of love to go around. Yeah, there's a lot of love to go around and everyone's been helped out some. Yeah. And so find find a mentor or find someone else that you can bounce ideas off of, you know, and, and don't don't be afraid to do that, you know, because, you know, we all need, uh, you know, we all need to be able to have sounding boards because now with Keith and I, you know, you know kind of who's mentored me. You know, now we talk about show ideas together and we hammer stuff out, yeah. you know, both for myself and, and for him also, mm -hmm. you know, we, you know, we, and, and so I'm, I'm, you know, kind of honored that he, you know, cares about, you know, what I think about those things. Cause his, you know, his channel is still uh, a lot bigger than mine. And, uh, yeah. well, man, I'm telling so, you, you, you're, uh, you're, you're on your way. So last time I looked at over 11,000 subscribers on YouTube, with yeah. that, that's, man, that's killer. So, yeah. but, uh, man, everybody needs to just go to askzack.com and, yeah. uh, and at that point in time, if anybody wants to con connect with you, contact you, ask questions or, you know, about anything, yeah. they can absolutely do that through there. Uh, yes. all the, uh, the necessary avenues are available to them. So yeah, there's a, there's a link to a ask me, you know, questions and I'm, I'm happy for anyone to reach out, you know, to me cause I, I, I love that. I love, you know, that, that sense of, of community and, you know, talking about guitars and, I, you know, and sometimes people will ask me to vet things. Like yeah. I've had people send me, you know, uh, like I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, you know, of deluxe reverbs and old blackface Fender amps and old Fender amps in general. And sometimes people will send me, uh, you know, a, a list, a sales listing or something like that. And they want me to help, help them vet it. And so I can, I know all those things. So I know the, <laughs> the, the, the caps that should be in a blackface fender and the, yeah. and the, the speaker codes and the transformer codes and all those things. And yeah. so that's, you know, so I, I, I do resource. that kind of thing. Also. So yeah. just to be able and to so know those that, things. 
and, and you know, and 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 when <laughs> if I do that, you know, a lot of times people will be will be kind and put something in the tip jar or something okay. like that for me. <laughs> yeah. So I do appreciate that. If I if I'm you know if I'm you know vetting a, a a vintage piece of gear or something like that, you know, I'm happy to do it. But you know, it's it's nice if you you know put a put a book or two in the old uh, in the old tip jar. Yeah, so that's I can get exactly a right. Well, Zach, so, man, we appreciate uh, everything. Yeah. Man, thanks for being a good friend to the show and a great friend Absolutely. to MIRC. Um, and, uh, man, we'd love to have you on again, just as things, you know, go down the road and we'll, you know, we'll talk about that, but man, we appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, thanks a bunch. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. The music retail show is brought to you by MIRC LLC, providing solutions for the musical instrument community by being a reliable source for diverse music products. If you need inventory for your music store, pawn shop, or e-commerce site, Go to MIRCweb.com to find out more.